Hello everyone. God, what an interesting evening and I, I just love having a peek into people's studies around the world and, and seeing, seeing what they're like. So um, when my dad was a small boy, when he was seven years old, he would spend hours alone in the countryside of Somerset around his home, uh, rootling in birds' nests, looking for caterpillars, burying tunnels in haystacks and of course his his mum didn't know where he was. When I was a similar age, a bit older, eight or nine, I would play on the common behind our home with only my little neighbour for company and again my mum and dad wouldn't know exactly where I was and I'd cycle off to primary school age 10 on my own. Um, my son Ted is six now and there he is in our garden and um, my twin girls are eight years old and I only realised this fairly recently, they've never been beyond a kind of adult's gaze out in the wild. And this massive shrinking in childhood liberty and roaming is repeated, our, our own family's experience across the generations is repeated really across the Western affluent world and certainly in, in cities it's, it's, it's repeated in that way. And this has happened really quickly for the vast course of our evolutionary history. As children, as, as young members of our species, we have learned by playing outdoors with other plants and animals. We have, have had this free wild childhood and suddenly in a generation it's gone and childhood very radically without us really knowing or planning it has moved indoors. Why has this happened? Uh, there's there's a, a modern principle of parenting that I didn't actually realise until, um, until I, I reflected on my own experience with my own children and, and that is that um, good parenting has become synonymous with perpetual supervision our children are never allowed out of our sight and indeed we would be considered neglectful if we didn't know where our children were at all times of the day. And this is a really powerful thing because no one wants to feel like they're a bad parent. The second thing is, in, in, in Britain at least, is a fear of stranger danger and um, it, it's become much more pervasive. This isn't really rational. In, in Britain in 12 months to March 2018, four children were murdered by strangers. That's roughly a one in three million chance, but of course none of us want to take that chance. And there is indeed, children are a bit like house sparrows, they're communal animals, and um, when, when lots of them disappear, they all disappear and so I, I can't really send my children out. I live in a rural village in, in Norfolk. I can't send my children out alone because there's no other children to play with. There's no safety in numbers anymore. The third reason why childhood has moved indoors so radically is um, a more rational one and that's our fear of traffic. And certainly the, the Norfolk lanes where I grew up, uh, I, I'd cycle actually alone to primary school age 10 for three miles and I'd barely meet three cars. They're now rat runs. The volume of traffic has increased exponentially. Um, and the sociologist Mayor Hillman really um, uh, hit the nail on the head with this because he, he pointed out that instead of removing the danger from our roads, which are actually public highways, um, they're, they're highways for people, not vehicles. Um, instead of removing the danger from our roads, we removed our children from danger. And so um, simply children don't walk to school anymore. I've, I've got a, a easy walk to our primary school and I, I walk our eight year olds there every day. In 1970, 80% of eight year olds walked to school unaccompanied by adults. So that is a radical, radical change. And, and it's a rational reason really to keep children indoors. Does this, does this all matter? Of course, some people will say it doesn't really. In, in Britain, 83% of us live in, in urban areas. The majority of the world now inhabits cities. We are um, city creatures, we're, we're indoor creatures, we adapt very rapidly. And so we need to learn to work, live and survive in cities. What use is a working knowledge of caterpillars in the global race? Well, there's two reasons why it matters, I think. One is that it's making us unwell. 
and um, more importantly it's making the planet unwell. I don't really need to labour this latter point too much but clearly if we grow up with no knowledge, no experience, no direct relationship with other species we're going to be much less likely to act to protect them, to live more lightly on the planet as we need to do to stop this terribly destructive wave of extinction that ultimately imperils us. But of course, as well, the sort of powerful argument in very um, anthropogenic times is, is the ill health it does us. Um, Britain, England in particular, is a kind of world leader in producing overweight, anxious and unhappy children. Uh, by the time children leave primary school in Britain, that's age 10 or 11, one in five of them are obese, they're overweight. And um, more damningly, one in eight under 19 year olds have a clinically diagnosed mental illness, a, a, a mental health disorder. There's, there's a vast increase in, in childhood unhappiness. And I would suggest that is linked to the lack of liberty, the, the constrained lives that so many of our children lead indoors. Um, and in America, there's uh, um, been some very interesting studies observing the decline in, in children's creativity over the last 30 years. And the author of an academic paper on this, um, Kung Hee Kim, concluded, and it's a damning conclusion, she, she wrote, over the last 20 years, children have become less emotionally expressive, less energetic, less talkative and verbally expressive, less humorous, less imaginative, less unconventional, less lively, less passionate, less perceptive, less apt to connect seemingly irrelevant things, less synthesizing, less able to see things from a different angle. Happily, of course, there's a library load of uh, positive scientific research that's coming out from all directions, uh, showing the beneficial impact of spending more time outdoors in green space. There's a huge amount of self-reported evidence. In Britain last year, a study of 20,000 people reported that those that spend just two hours a week outdoors reported significantly better mental and physical health. And these effects applied whether these people were old, young, rich, poor, or healthy, or um, sick. And interestingly, people reported even more positive health if they spent that time in more biodiverse green space. So nature reserves or wildish places look like they're better for us than parks with scalp grass and all the life removed from them. There's also all kinds of ingenious um, neuroscientific stuff going on in, in Edinburgh, in the UK and Scotland. Uh, um, walkers through a rural area, for an urban area rather, were, were hooked up with um, headsets that performed mobile electroencephalographs and it recorded when the walkers moved through green space, significantly higher levels of frustration, sorry, significantly lower levels of frustration in green space and higher levels of, of equality they called meditation. There's there's also big data now providing really convincing epidemiological evidence of the, of the benefits of green space and being outdoors. A, a, a long-term long study over three decades of one million Danes looked at the amount of green space in their childhood neighbourhood and then tracked their mental health and it found that those with significantly more green space in their childhood neighbourhood had between 15 and 55 percent less chance of developing one of 16 different mental illnesses later on in life. What can we do about this um, childhood moving indoors, this, this drastic loss of childhood liberty? There's three really simple but quite radical things that we can, we can do to fix this and, and thankfully the coronavirus crisis has opened our eyes to this and I'm sure George Monbiot is going to talk more about this later but um, suddenly in lockdown where I am in rural Norfolk the traffic's disappeared from the roads and we can see what potential we have to rediscover the roads to reclaim the streets and rediscover them as places of play so my kids can now go out biking and I don't need to worry about them because there's so few cars on the roads already some cities have started to do this try and try and reclaim their street from the tyranny of the car but um we we can do this without government support uh, we motorists I'm a, I'm a driver myself we could take a pledge to abstain from driving one Sunday every month and have a have a car free Sunday obviously key workers could still use their cars but you know we could we could reclaim the streets as, as places for our children to play safely the second thing we could do I think is recognize that if we are an urban species these days then access to high quality green space within a kilometer of home is a human right 
it's, it's a basic right for all of us. And um, it's, sadly, it's been exposed that access to high quality green space is hugely unequal during the lockdown. And, and um, it's been seen that more deprived communities have much less access to, to public green space. Indeed, in, in certain underprivileged um, cities or, or large towns like Middlesbrough, um, all the parks were closed for, for, for much of the lockdown in Britain, denying people that, that public space that they so badly need. Britain's national parks were drawn up in the depths of the Second World War as part of the coronavirus, um, post-coronavirus settlement and the rebuilding of society. Why can't we draw up a pledge to create a new generation of urban parks? This is universally popular. It crosses political boundaries. It would be a simple thing that our political leaders could lead the way on. Simple and popular. The third thing is already happening. And that's rewilding our schools and bringing a bit of wildness back to back to schools. Many state primary schools without any funding help from anyone are now running forest school sessions whereby children get uh, a weekly or, or monthly um, session in some local woods and, and there's trained practitioners to help them. And it's very much child led experiences. There's a, there's a campfire. Children can make things with, with real tools out of wood, but it's very much about creativity and allowing children space to dream and play and, and choose their own adventures. And this is happening and it just needs a little bit of a shove from government. And um, we, could, we could give it that shove in, in the post Corona virus settlement and, and, and invest in this. Um, teachers, there need to be some money to go into uh, giving teachers some additional training, but why couldn't we move all lessons outdoors for perhaps one hour a day? It's been shown that forest schools not only benefit children's physical health and ability to concentrate at school, but conventional academic attainment is, is, is raised among children who attend a forest school session regularly alongside their conventional schooling. So this stuff works even on the incredibly narrow confines that we now judge school success upon. So that's three things that we could do. But um, us parents need retraining too, because we've come to see uh, experiences in the natural world as something that we can either buy or, um, or that we deliver to our children, sort of didactic rule-based experiences. It's all, don't touch this, or, or have you heard about this species? It's going extinct, it's fear, it's not getting direct hands-on experience. And, and the greatest gift I believe that as parents we can give our children is to facilitate their free play in green space close to our homes, to cultivate a local patch and allow our children to form bonds, relationships with the nature around them in their neighbourhood. Uh, the kids are going to be all right though. We worry, we, we, we frame it as their problem that they're um, addicted to screens, that they're inside all the time, that they're you know, eating too much and so on. But um, against all odds, really, this generation is, is, is showing us adults the way. And uh, we've seen it with the school strikes across the Western world. An extinction rebellion is growing new shoots. And children really get that the seriousness of the, of the great extinction we're facing and the action we need to take. Children may well prove to be better parents than my generation. I think they will. And they may just open up the time and space in nature to create happier people and a healthier planet. Thank you very much.